Okay. Well, welcome. Thank you so much for joining Historic Richmond's virtual lecture program. For those of you who don't know us, Historic Richmond is a nonprofit with a mission to preserve, protect, and promote Richmond's historic buildings, neighborhoods, and places. Tonight, we will talk about a truly unique historic site, one whose history and people may not have been heard, and in many respects will be difficult to ever know. We are exciting, excited to be helping to uncover and tell some of those stories. From colonial era loyalists to enslaved workers to the families who resided there in the 20th century, both black and white. The most recent owners were the Honorable and Mrs. James Sheffield. Judge Sheffield was the first black judge appointed to a Virginia court since Reconstruction. Now about our program. We are particularly want to thank, we're particularly thankful to our wonderful sponsors, Dominion Energy and TCV Trust and Wealth Management for supporting our work as we pivot to the virtual world and develop new and different programs to replace those originally planned before social distancing. One of those programs that we have held, let's see, annually, I'm just trying to flip the slide, there we go, um, and in person has been our Rehab Expo. It's intended to connect owners of historic properties with resources for planning restoration work. Since we were unable to hold the Rehab Expo in person, we thought a virtual program might be of interest. So tonight we're teaming up with the Department of Historic Resources to discuss how to research historic properties, how DHR's architectural historians and archeologists evaluate their significance. And finally, a little bit about the process for listing on the national registers. We thought it would be helpful to those of you at home looking at DIY how-to tips for your own properties to walk through the process while using Brookberry as a case study. Historic Richmond's goal, oops, sorry, has been to see Brookberry documented and evaluated by DHR. The Sheffields appreciated the significance and had tried unsuccessfully to list the property on the National Register. We knew that Brookberry and its surviving slave dwellings were very rare. And we also knew that the Sheffields association with the property was an additional layer of significance and wanted to see that documented and appreciated. There are countless layers here, both known and unknown. And we have enjoyed working to reveal each layer so far. And if Brookbury is ultimately sold at auction later this year, we would dearly love to see Brookbury in the hands of another family who appreciates its historic significance the way we do. So now for our panel. We wish we could have had one of the Sheffield's daughters participate this evening, but unfortunately she was unable to attend. So. I'm Danielle Porter, Historic Richmond's Director of Preservation. I graduated from the University of New Hampshire and I hold a Master's in Historic Preservation from Pratt Institute. I formerly worked as an architectural historian at a local consulting firm where I focused on architectural survey work in Virginia and the Mid-Atlantic region. In my five years at Historic Richmond, I've done everything from managing pro uh, preservation projects at Monumental Church, advocating for the preservation of Richmond's historic places, pushing for preservation-minded policies, and organizing the content of educational events like this panel discussion. Mark Wagner has been a member of the Virginia Department of Historic Resources staff for 26 years and currently serves as an architectural historian for the department's Eastern Region Preservation Office. He has researched and written on topics ranging from Nelson County's 1790s Woodson Mills to 1950s Streamline Diners to the design of historic golf courses. His work at DHR has featured several major projects, such as the preliminary work for the World Heritage Domination of the Virginia State Capitol and the successful historic designation of Tangier Island Historic District. Mark received an American Studies BA from Manhattanville College and an architectural history MA from the University of Virginia Architecture School. Mike Clem has worked as an archeologist in the Mid-Atlantic region for more than 25 years, much of that time focused in Virginia. He earned his BA from Georgetown and an MA in anthropology from American University. His primary interest and focus has been on historic domestic sites from slave quarters to tenant farms, as well as larger plantation sites. He's also worked on industrial sites and numerous Civil War encampments, as well as large pre-colonial sites. Prior to joining DHR, he worked for several consulting firms and for a number of years was the archeologist for Loudoun County, Virginia. So let's, oh, 
sorry, there we are. Um, here are some photos of Brookberry, and um, let's begin. Okay, so first I wanna make sure everyone knows who Judge Sheffield is. He was the first black judge to be appointed to a Virginia court since the Reconstruction era. He learned a law earned a law degree from Howard University Law School in 1963. He clerked for Spotswood Robinson and the chief counsel of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. He opened his own practice in Jackson Ward and played a crucial role in the erection of the Bill Bojangles Robinson Monument which broke down racial barriers in the city and paved way for more of these monuments and statues dedicated to African-Americans. In 1976, he and his wife, Patricia Sheffield, purchased the property Brookberry. So let's see, without even leaving your desk or the comfort of your couch, you can learn a lot about a property. The first place I always check is the City of Richmond Parcel Mapper, which is this website right here. And you can pretty much Google Richmond Parcel Mapper or your city or county's name file, followed by Parcel Mapper, tax records, and it, it should just pop up in Google as the first one. So you type in your property's address and click on the property. So here's a property card. And under here, you can see, um, under transfers, the date that it transferred and who it was from, and there's a deed reference number. So kind of keep keep that in mind. And under, okay, under extensions, it does give you a date for the building. Um, it's not always 100% accurate, especially when you get to older buildings. So for the purpose of Brookberry, it said that it was built in 1758. Um, Anyway, the second place I like to check, and this is more relevant when we're looking at properties in what was Richmond proper, like old city center. Um, and these were the fire insurance maps. And they tell you um, property use, stories, material, and give you a pretty approximate location of where the building is on the property. It's not drawn quite to scale, but it, it's pretty close. And the, map, the years that these maps were produced for Richmond were 1896, 1905, and 1919. Um, and again, you know, the, these maps were used in cities, not rural areas. So they we couldn't really use these when researching Brookberry. Some other really helpful maps worth looking up, again, if you're looking in Richmond city proper are the 1835 Bates, 1877 beers and 1889 based and then there's a lot of really great stuff if you go to the valentine collections and uh, you just click on the global search you can also email their archives assistant and schedule an in-person visit but here are some of the photos that we found while going through just the online uh, valentine collection and then there's a lot of really great books about Richmond's history. And these are some of the most frequent books that I like to reference. But uh, Mary Wingfield Scott, our founder at Historic Richmond wrote Houses of Old Richmond and Old Richmond Neighborhoods, which are digitized online. Historic Richmond has a number of publications, including the Churchill Old and Historic District, the Richmond Fan District, Architecture in Downtown Richmond and Old Richmond Today and Selden Richardson's Built by Blacks. And there, there's more of these at the library, but again, these are just the ones I use most often. So now we will go on to uh, talking about the DHR archives. And Mike, you just let me know when to flip the slides. Yeah, great. Um, here at DHR, we have a system called VCRIS um the virginia cultural uh, resource information system and um you can search that um you can come to our offices and make use of that or you can uh apply for an account um if you're a professional archaeologist um and uh, if you're looking for architectural stuff it's a little easier um, um a lot of archaeological sites are, are restricted um and uh the information is um 
But it's a really great system. Um, I've worked in other states and very few places have something as detailed and, and as um, easy to use as this. Um, but you can put in an address. You can see up there on the top right, it's kind of mangled. I don't know what's going on with that, but map um, address. Um, you can put in an address and search for a site, or you can search by name if you know the property name or the house name or the site name. Um, a lot of ways to do it, and it gives you a very detailed report. Uh, the I, th I believe the historic um, structures um, often include a lot of um, photographs now. Uh, a lot of those have been digitized. Um, and uh, even some background in there, at least some references to other documents that you might be able to find. It's a really great system, it includes mapping and, and just detailed uh, uh, text. So really great system to use. And okay. uh, there, there's an example of, um, well, the, there are different tabs you can see along the, the middle there, uh, primary resource, secondary resource. And these are examples of some of the files that are there uh, attached to it, um, including the photos. I'm sorry, Daniel, you keep on sorry. switching. Yeah. Let's see, here's more of the Habs. Yeah. Okay. All right, do you need me to back up or? No, no, I think it's good. I think it's good. Uh, there's a lot of information on this particular property there as far as um, the structure goes. Um, there hasn't been a lot of or any archaeology as far as I know directly on the property um, so that's something that could be filled in later um, but you may have different uh, experiences with your property maybe it was tested uh, archaeologically at some point so you'll you'll be able to find that um, so yeah that's it okay thank you Mike sure so personal collection um, so much of what we know about Brookbury is from the Sheffield's personal collections. They wanted to list the house on the National Register and had been researching its history. And the Bemis family, who was not who the Sheffield's bought the house from, but had owned the property for about the first half of the 20th century, had sent a number of letters to the Bemises kind of relaying what they knew about the property. And that's what you're looking at here, a letter and a map that they had sent. And um, according to them and many other people, it was said that the land had been surveyed by William Byrd II in the early 1700s, and that an English man by the name of Brookbury built the house before the Revolutionary War, but he was in sympathy with the British and returned to England. Um, however, let's see, here's the house in 1902. Uh, the Sheffields reached out to Colonial Williamsburg, and this was all just done over photographs, not in person, but they, they really thought that the house was more likely 19th century. So when the Sheffields purchased the property in 1976, it was just over eight acres. When the Bemis family had purchased the property in 1902, so the image that we're seeing here, Brookbury Farm was 350 acres, and it extended all the way back to Falling Creek. Uh, it, it consisted of woodland, streams, springs, cultivated field pastures where cows and sheep grazed, pig pens, chicken yards, duck ponds, turkeys, and even a flock of guineas. Um, so there was the main house. Here's, here's another view of it with the addition that the Bemises put on in 1924. Um, and there were Several historic buildings. So what they have, what they're calling the servants' houses and would have been the servants' houses at that time were previously the slave cabins. And and then you have other buildings that aren't quite as old, uh, like the tea house, the boys' cottage. Um, and there was a playhouse, a garage, um, a barn, a workshop. They built so many buildings for their sons and daughters. But besides just um, the personal collections that we have on this, you could possibly, in researching your own home, find personal collections by going to the 
Virginia Museum of History and Culture, formerly the Virginia Historical Society, and they have lots of information that you can just search online or there's hard copies, you, you might have more luck in person, but lots of records on individuals and families from their personal collections. Uh, so now I'm gonna pass it on to Mark to talk about kind of physically investigating the building. Uh, thank you, Danielle. Um, we had the great opportunity to go out there in late February. It was actually cold back then. Um, we went out as a team, and we often don't work in larger teams, but Mike and myself, Elizabeth Lifford, Blake McDonald, visited and uh, met with HRF staff and the owner. And go go back to that first slide, because I'm going to use that for some of my description there. Thanks. Um, so we knew from those, you just saw real quickly those 1970s files that we have, and that's about all we knew about it. And we knew that potentially it could be 1752 house. Um, we go out to properties to see how well the materials square with the actual story of the house and the story of um, the early uh, construction of the house. And we analyze the materials and we talked to the owner and get um, some of their information as well, which we did that day back in February. Pulling in the driveway, we saw that it was, yes, a big federal style house, five bays wide, gable roof. It had several additions on it. And you'll note some really cool um, granite blocks. That was a either carriage mounting block or horse mounting block. And it could actually be something that goes well back into the 19th century. Um, the house has some colonial revival porches that were put on, and we probably think those might relate to the 1920s edition. But on the left side, you see a 1918 edition, and then peeking around the corner is a later edition. But that central uh, large two-story section uh, is definitely a federal period house. What do we mean by federal? Federal style can date anywhere from the 1780s on up to very late into the 1820s, 1830s. I tended to think almost right away because of the slimness of those end chimneys that it was probably late in that period. Go on to the next slide. Mm -hmm. So we went around the corner. We were dressed up in our winter gear, as you can see uh, back then. Um, and surprise, this beautiful, well-executed colonial uh, revival vestibule, very detailed. And if you go on to the next slide, you'll get a, a full view of that. Yeah, uh, a second entrance, a, a second primary facade uh, designed by, I believe, Mr. Bemis or Bemis and um, drawn by Harry uh, Baskerville, very well-known architect in Richmond who designed, for instance, the Medical College of Virginia, that Art Deco Tower on Broad Street. Hmm. Um, go on. Next slide. So we explored, because we are very curious about every part of the house, so we have to get into the basement, go up to the attic, uh, this shows you just a sample, and I think this is actually a part of the basement that was underneath um, the more modern part of the house. It still had six course uh, brickwork. What do we mean when we're looking at bricks? Um, the earliest brick you'd find that relates to the 18th century would be Flemish bond, and then as you go later, the courses, all of these headers, the long part of the brick, there are more rows as you get further into the 19th century of those big stretcher uh, bricks. Um, this is a six course uh, bond, which really relates more to the 1920s. Go on to the next slide. Uh, we went into the old part of the basement, and that's where we saw some really cool stuff. This, uh, you're looking underneath the floor, and there's a big floor beam right there, uh, lower in the image. We could tell that that was probably milled and hand finished, uh, that very large uh, structural element. And that's not something that you're going to see in that size probably after the 1850s. Um, the stuff at the top of the image, that's actually underside of the floorboards. And those little squares that you see 
cut, that's called gauging, gauging and planing, and it's made to uh, fit all of those boards together nice and tightly. So you're getting a lot of hand-done uh, features here in the old section. It was not rebuilt, so you have original fabric here. Probably we know right away this is 19th century. Next, please. Uh, staircase. Now, it's very interesting. This is rather simple for the period, but very elegant. Uh, this is from first floor center hall up to the second floor. And I think the wood, at least the floor wood, is probably maple. Maybe some of that was done in the 1920s, but a lot of the trim that you're seeing, the window frame that's peeking up from the floor, has little bosses at the corner. Uh, that's a Greek revival feature. So certainly uh, a style that is well into the 1820s, but very elegant and very intact, a beautiful staircase system. Go on. Uh, there's a full view of the staircase uh, as you enter into the uh, front hall of the house. You see it's very simple, delicate, featured, uh, very fine wood. There's even some historic wallpaper there. Um, this is a, a wonderful uh, a central hall uh, federal, simple federal period um, staircase. Next slide. Um, we noticed that a lot of original old trim still survives in this house. So you get the original mantel pieces, very uh, distinguished and uh, um, a lot less quirky than the earlier stuff in the 18th century. This is beautifully, highly designed, highly crafted mantel pieces. The door casings have Greek Revival uh, bosses in the corners, and you get a very, very fine six panel door. I think it had some graining on it, but I can't remember. It might not be grain, it might just be natural wood, but lots of original early 19th century features still survive in that core part of the uh, old house. Next slide. Um, we stepped and this just shows you we were back in the 1920s section talking to joy sheffield cyan was making some kind of point i guess and uh talking about the history of the house but uh you can see joy is over there on the right they kept the colonial revival theme going in that wonderful back section you see the french uh doors uh and a mantelpiece that echoes the federal uh, mantel pieces, it's a little bit simplified, but it includes marble. So they kept a very high level of design and materials in that back section in the 1920s. Go ahead. Um, just a few more things we noticed. We went upstairs, and this is a, probably the only uh, opportunity we had to see lath uh, exposed, but that's hand split. Um, the material over it might have been a later type of wallboard, but underneath it, you get the real deal. This is stuff that was split by hand and nailed with small wrought uh, uh, nails. So uh, a lot of the original materials, this is um, certainly before the Civil War. Next slide. Yes, this is the one where I kept, kept Mike uh, up in the attic. We got back into that old attic area. And right away, you'll notice, you can see the light hitting the, the wood across the top there. All of those beautiful um, uh, wood structural uh, beams there are very smooth and milled, um, maybe hand finished. They're joined and pegged. But when Mike, and you're going to see another map uh, coming up from 1937, we noticed there were dams on the Pocashock Creek on one side of the property. They had uh, mills there for grain and probably mills there for cutting wood. So the brick, the wood, lots of the materials were made right on site and you can't really make it out, but the brick in the end wall there is a three course. So three stretcher bonds between the header bonds, which indicates that it is certainly before 1840 and more likely 1830s and 1820s. That confirmed uh, that date to us. It wasn't Flemish bond, which would have been 18th century, but three-course uh, American bond. Beautiful structural system. 
and very intact, highly intact in the attic. Go ahead. Um, furthermore, this is a cool thing, and the photo came out, fortunately. Um, this shows Roman numeral system. So you likely had enslaved people building this stuff on the ground, right out in the front yard or on the side yard. The craftsmen there would mark the beams, send it up to the guys working up on top of the, the structure, and they would join it following that number system. You can't make it out too well, but there's a peg there too. It's pegged together, um, beautifully done. And also notice the extremely wide roof boards. Those are called purlins. And you can't get a piece of wood that wide these days unless you find it at the bottom of some lake in Washington State or something. So go ahead. Um, I'm just going to make, I'm going to finish with just saying this is a very rare five bay early 19th century house in Richmond. Um, it's part of a family. The Craig house is probably the oldest, and this is in the bottom. Uh, 1780, so we have some stuff to compare uh, Brookbury to, and then the next slide, just a few miles away, um, literally I think just about five miles away, Bellwood, another good example to compare Brookbury to. This one dates to the 1790s and has a different roof profile, but, and that portico on the front was added much later. So there's a there's a family of these, and this is in Chesterfield County, I think, or right on the edge, like Brookbury, um, but fairly rare to find this early house, and even more rare when you find one that has a slave quarters. Um, I'll make one quick point uh, for you guys out there researching Virginia McAllister, a field guide to American architecture is good to use, and the Chesapeake. House uh, editor Carl Lounsbury is the other good uh, book to use when you're out in the field trying to analyze old houses. Thank you, Mark. Um, the Virginia McAllister book is my favorite book. <laughs> yes, everybody uses that one. <laughs> uh, all right, Mike, why don't you kind of go on and talk to us a little about uh the archaeology uh archaeological potential on the site and different areas you think could be worth investing yeah sure um i don't know if you can you point at things in there for me i can or, or can you see my mouse pointing yeah, right now yeah can you go where okay. the house is in yes, so the center so right here's the house right here yep yeah um so this is a this was 1930s uh, 37, I think. 37, that's, yeah. Um, so this was found and it's really, really useful. Um, and it gave me a lot of clues. You see all the, the waterways in there, those those jagged, uh, you know, curved lines on, on the sides of the property. And coming up from the bottom right corner, you see another one. Um, and up in the top left corner coming in. Those are little drainages, small streams, maybe intermittent, maybe uh, maybe flowing um, constantly. I, I don't really know. They're they're sort of lost now because of development around there. Um, you know, the surface water has changed a lot um, with development. So, but um, that the first thing that that strikes me um, when I see something like that is uh, the potential for prehistoric. Uh, pre pre contact sites, um, those spring heads like that one uh, down in the south, um, on the on the far right side behind the house, going up, yeah, right in there is probably a spring head. There may have been water coming out of the ground there. That's the kind of that's a really good place to look for, uh, you know, little campsites. People need water. You know, if you're moving across the landscape. Uh, looking for game or looking for other resources, um, you got to find water, and and so those are good places to find little campsites. Uh, the bigger stream down on the bottom left and the bottom right, also really good places to find uh, find pre-contact sites. Um, 
and also, um, you know, we we know that uh, water is an important um, resource for for everyone. So um, field slave quarter sites are often going to be near uh, some source of water, um, near the field, near the water. You need, you know, an easy commute. Uh, you know, a, a, something that doesn't waste a lot of time getting to the field, and and you need a source of water. So often on plantations, they'll uh, locate the field slave quarter sites, you know, in, in a spot like that. Um, I think north is up on this map, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And so right behind the house is where there's a little square rectangle, something, yeah, right in, right down in there. Um, is where the standing quarter sites are. Um, it seems pretty certain that one, two, several of those may have been um, always in place. Others may have been moved there. We don't know for sure. Um, that's a good place for archaeology to answer questions. Um, you know, we know there are structures standing there now, um, but the, the remains in the ground can help us understand how long they've been there when they were built we don't know that um you know they could have been some of the earliest structures there maybe even before the house itself um it's not an uncommon thing to have um, some slaves go onto a property and start preparing it for your house that you're going to build and clearing fields and that kind of thing those could predate the house um you also find other things associated with that. Yeah, there we go. So there's the house, the big block in the middle there with all the rooms identified and the quarters back on the left, on the left side of the screen there. Um, what is this date to, Danielle? Do you remember? Uh, this was um, it, drawn by one of the Bemis daughters as like a recollection yeah. of what had been there. Yeah, and this kind of stuff is really helpful too. Um, it's not always correct, but archaeology can answer that. Um, but it's nice to know, to know where other buildings are. If you're doing archaeology on the property, um, you can see where those things may have been. You know, you, if you find something out there, um, you've got you've got a potential answer here. Um, this site has so much. I yeah. to, um, just mentioned in the front yard says millstone. So there's another connection to yeah, really potentially. Good mill that was on the property anyway yeah. no that's good yeah and i was going to get to that those streams oh. down there that we saw on that first map no th thanks for the reminder um um as mark said there are good uh place to you know find mills i mean we're pretty sure they were there um and you know everything leaves a footprint um doesn't matter what you do um there's always evidence left behind and um so yeah, uh, you know, all these things, uh, the nice thing about archeology span and, and the nice thing about having all these documents is they give us good clues, um, but they leave a lot, of, um, um, a lot of questions unanswered and archeology span is really good about filling in some of those gaps and, and answering uh, questions. Uh, that line of small structures there on the left side, one says laundry, I think. Um, mm -hmm. And, and so, you know, we can answer those questions too. There's a dairy at the far end. A dairy is going to be um, a different kind of building. Uh, there will be clues about that. So um, we can piece this all together. Uh, there should be an out kitchen um, somewhere somewhere there. Um, it may be that double, double structure, that double wide structure on the bottom left. Um, partially quarters and partially kitchen we don't know um anyway so um is there another slide uh, what's the next one yeah so here are the slave quarters yeah um mark may have a comment about these um yeah um so this is a double unit and they shared the chimney that you see sticking up in the center there um and you can jump in Mike, if you want. Uh, yeah. I think that we concluded when we were going, walking through these that uh, the part on the right looks like it might have been added on slightly after the first mm -hmm. part was built on the left. And that's that kind of additive construction happens all the time. Um, but uh, yeah, we 
think based on the timber work, the brick, um, their dirt floors, there, there might have been wood floors at one point, but there was no, um, those are long gone. Uh, right. The windows, and there was some original, I think there was some older uh, weatherboard uh, at the end that you don't, around the corner that you don't see, probably dates this uh, 1840s, uh, mid, closer to mid century, mm -hmm. but um, extremely rare to find these surviving in uh, Richmond suburban um, areas. Um, although this is about eight acres, as I, as, as I recall. So this is a very large parcel, but yeah, anyway. Yeah, and the, and the thing archaeologically here with that, that can help us out is uh, they're very distinct. Um, you know, at the time that Brookberry was was built was sort of a transition in um, in everyday ceramics, uh, going from creamware, creamware and pearlware into uh, later whiteware. Um, and often the uh, earlier creamware and pearlware gets handed down. Um, as the household buys new materials, often the the leftovers from um, the old sets get passed to the slaves. And so you'll find uh, at a place like this, it might be easier to date because you'll find those leftover wares around the quarters, uh, you know, in the ground, little bits of it. Um, and you'll find, so you'll find old ceramics, but more modern bottle glass, say. Um, and so that's always a good clue if you're out in the field and you find, uh, find uh, say, creamware with a bottle glass that dates to the mid-century. Um, it's always a good clue that maybe you're dealing with a, a quarter site. Um, and so some of those questions could be answered at these, um, these various structures on the property. Um, it may actually help on a full survey of the property to um, to see if there are other quarter sites or even small tenant houses anywhere else on the property. There are a lot of clues in the ground if you look. Let's see what's next. Oh, ah, that's good. That's a uh, shot inside. Yeah, I stuck my hand in the window. We couldn't get in fully. And uh, the that's boards that I was talking about with the. Yeah. Uh, I think that might be a hand wrought nail, um, or or at least a, a later um, pressed nail that you yeah. see. The old dot on the board there is a is a uh, antebellum nail. Yeah, on the on the sort of bottom left there. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think um, I think it was a uh, hand. Uh, it was a cut nail, but with a handmade head. So okay. probably pre-1829, 30, somewhere. Okay. There. Yeah. Um, you get the machine-headed nails in, after 1830s. Right. Um, so that really fits in with the date you suspect for the house as well. So mm -hmm. um, little clues. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, sure. Huh. All right, Mark, will you talk about... Yeah listing on the National Register in general and as well how it kind of ties into Brookbury and where we're at? Sure, sure. Um, of course, this is our nation's system of uh, honoring, celebrating important places, whether it be a site or an object, a building or a historic district. And you're looking at uh, the bulletin that's ancient now. I think this was probably written back or updated back in the 80s, uh, but this is online and you can uh, go to the National Park Service. We use the criteria developed by the National Park Service and their bulletins that tell you how to put something on the register. So go ahead to the next slide and we'll just talk very, very briefly. This really boils it all down. It's a two-step process. Danielle and her team put together uh, preliminary information form, that's what PIF means there, uh, to make the argument for significance. And our evaluation committee, a group of about eight to 10 of us, uh, looked at it, experts weighed in, said, yes, this is eligible. We took it to the state review board in June and they discussed it. So at this point, as of June 18th, um, 
DHR has officially said it is eligible for the Virginia Landmarks Register and the National Register of Historic Places. We use two, two uh, listings in this state. Not all states do. Um, at this point, by the way, you can use state tax credits to do rehabilitation work. You can get that incentive, a 25% um, credit, credit towards approved work. So if you spend $100,000, you get $25 thousand dollars credited towards your state tax liability but uh, we can always get into more detail if you want to contact and talk to us about that the second part of this is writing a formal nomination and that's a little bit more detailed than the PIF you take the bones of the PIF and you just expand on them and uh, the wonderful thing about Brookberry you can talk about archaeology, you can talk about uh, plantation life and early uh, 19th century history, and then go all the way up to the Sheffield uh, family and civil rights. And uh, Danielle's going to talk about some of the famous people who came to this property. But this property is significant all the way from the start, 1820s, 1830s all the way to the 1970s and mike even indicated possibly earlier archaeology on the property as well so uh all together you can do this in about six to nine months um but it usually takes about a year to go through this full process the nomination goes to our boards uh, we present it and then it eventually goes on up to the keeper of the register for national listing next slide there's did you want me to talk a little bit about the significance parts yeah so there were i think three questions that came back from that's right that's right so um we know that judge sheffield um had an office in jackson ward and you're seeing it right there it's actually right in the center of the photograph i think so his office survives um what portion of work did he do there? Was he back at the house? And a lot of judges have studies and they do a lot of work at their houses. So he could be somebody who is writing decisions and writing important documents in his home office. That's something that we would probably find out more if we talk to the family, talk to his colleagues who work with him. Um, we'd wanna know more about that, but the Judge Sheffield uh, part of this story needs to be filled out a little bit more. Next slide. And his, just to add to that, his office is within the Jackson Ward Historic yes. District, which is, you know, state register, national register, and it's actually a national historic landmark. So I think there needs to be some kind of, you know, differentiation between yeah. what he did where. The other thing is it's a, I think it's a current tax credit project too. So it's actually it getting rehab yeah. as well. <laughs> All right. Um, we were interested in the story, the, the subdivision around Brookbury, which is now called Brookbury. And here's what Brookbury, but yeah, here's it's almost, what was Brookbury. Right, right, right. Um, this was uh, land that was developed for middle class, upper middle class African Americans. What's that story? Where does that come from? Um, it, and it happened before the Sheffields came there. I think it started in the late 60s to uh, well into the 1970s. So that's a part uh, of the significance, part of the, the longer story here. And then finally, I think there's one more. We wanted to know more about the architect and who had designed that. And actually, Danielle has already pinned that down. Uh, Mr. Bemis drew the, I guess, uh, came up with the scheme, and then uh, Henry Baskerville drew out uh, the details on this. Um, even though you have an antebellum house, this 1920s stuff. And then, as I was saying, the 1960s and 70s stuff is very interesting. We don't want to overlook any of these aspects for potential significance. Okay, thank you, Mark. 
So at this point, you know, we had written the PIF and it was determined eligible. So tax credits are available and we could have just kind of ended the research process as at that point. But as we always say, preservation is not just about buildings, it's about people. And we so badly wanted to know, you know, who lived here, not just owners, but enslaved servants, tenants, you know, when was Brookbury built? Where did the name Brookbury come from? So we decided to do a title search and a title search traces the deeds of a property and a deed can provide a lot of information about the owner and a description of what they owned. So let's see, sorry. So here's our title search and kind of um, each year that a different family purchased the property. And um, you can do a title search for free at your local courthouse. Uh, so if you're in Richmond, such as the John Marshall Courthouse, or you can access most jurisdictions records online by going to the locality's clerk's office record room. Um, but there can be a it's subs subscription cost associated with that, and, and it can be a substantial cost. Um, so, so to begin, if you recall way back at the beginning of the program, when we were looking up the Richmond parcel mapper, there was a deed reference number. So to start, you need to get the oldest deed reference number on that page from the tax record. And you look up that deed. And then from there, it'll reference the number to the previous deed, which is how you start kind of building it back. But things aren't always quite so black and white because in um, in older deeds, you have to make a lot of assumptions. The acreage between one owner to the next might not have actually changed, but the way they measured it, you know, whoever's taking the measurement might show 160 acres in one year and then 10 years later, they're measuring 170 acres. Um, and sometimes properties are added to or parceled off, or they're literally just difficult to read because they're handwritten. Um, so in our research, we're able to get back to the first half of the 19th century, even a little bit earlier, so 1833. Um, some of the interesting things that we kind of discovered through this title search is uh, the properties only starts being referenced as Brookbury in the 1882 deed. Uh, before that, no one refers to it as Brookbury, and but but we know it's the same property and that that the house is still there. Um, and then just to kind of interesting to note, I thought was 1844, the Smiths own the property. They own it for 20 years through 1864, and in Edward Smith's will, uh, he refers to the property as a plantation. So we kind of um, let's see here. Here's a copy of what one of those deeds may look like. Um, so, so then we really wanted to know who's Brookberry or where is Brookberry derived from? And we think that that may have been uh, Thomas Vivian Brooking. So he's a colonel in the Revolutionary War and um, his great grandfather was a general and English royalist. Um, and sorry, he was not a colonel in the Revolutionary War. That was another relative, but he was a colonel in, um, I believe it was the War of 1812. So, yeah. sorry. So we, but his family, it's a whole list of uh, colonels and generals and everyone's involved in the military. And, and his great grandfather who is named Vivian Brooking um, was the general and English royalist. And we know that the Brookings live in Chesterfield County on Falling Creek, but we don't know exactly where they live. So it may have been Brookbury, if, you know, and it may have been somewhere else. Uh, they, in one of their documents, they refer to their home as Bellevue. And we have not been able to determine where Bellevue is, nor was the Chesterfield County Historical Society. Um, so, so that's kind of the closest connection that we can come up with between uh, to to where the name Brookberry comes from. But it, and I, it feels like we're close, but we're not a hundred percent there. Another helpful resource is the mutual assurance records, and you can find this. Um, the Mary Washington University has a link on their website that you can do to just even see if a policy exists. 
and and then it's still you can't pull the policy from the website but you can um you know then go to the library of virginia or the um virginia museum of history and culture to try to pull those records and actually look at what was there and that can give you a lot of information on what was insured and sometimes there's even sketches and then there's the library of virginia which is a really one they have so many resources so if you're looking at a house that again is in like the older um, more historic core of richmond you can use the city directories and that gives you name addresses occupations and that's for anyone who um would have been an occupant not just the owner you can look at um, all different maps of Virginia and Richmond, and you can pull building permits but, uh, from 1907 to 1976. But in the 1960s, Richmond did discard a number of blueprint drawings for buildings that would have had construction costs totaling less than 10,000, which really would be kind of equivalent to a building of like a million today. So, so you might have stuff that on Monument Ave, they still have the building permit drawings, but you probably for a row house in any other historic neighborhood might not. Um, they have a wonderful collection of books, and then you can also access the census records and ancestry when you are there. So, so we know a little bit about people who lived or spent time at Brookberry. Um, what we have here is Benjamin Temple's will from 1837, and he, this is a list of many of the people who had been enslaved by him, um, and I guess a value associated with them. And in the, in Edward Smith's will, and he's the one who refers to it as a plantation. He instructs for his, so he dies and that's why the house is sold off in 1864. And he instructs his wife to sell the plantation, but keep Lucy and her three children to herself, give Sam to his niece and to treat the old man well. I don't have the quote in front of me, but along the lines of as he's been a, good slave and as long as he keeps up that attitude, you know, keep treating him well. Um, we know that the Robert and Alice Ross and their kids lived at Brookbury prior to the Bemises purchasing the property in 1902 and they stayed there after the Bemises purchased Brookbury as well. And uh, the children would follow around Mr. Ross as if he were a Pied Piper. And he was always on the children's side in an argument. And Mrs. Ross cooked the finest gourmet food in the world. That is from a Bemis letter. Charles Grant Page, who was a chauffeur for the Bemises and stayed there for 50 years. And everyone seemed to admire him. Um, John and Bertha Burrell, who lived there around 1952, I'm not, I, definitely in 1952, I don't know if they lived there much longer or later or earlier than that, but um, we do have a letter from a man named Al Lacey, whose family lived at Brookbury in 1952, and he recalls that the slave quarters were occupied by an African-American named John Burrell and his family. His wife's name was Bertha. They had three children. John looked after Brookberry Farm. They raised cattle. John entertained by my brother and me at times, riding us around on the tractor. So prior to the Sheffield's ownership, the Brookberry had just been owned by a series of white families. Um, but the change of ownership to, to the Sheffields and the subsequent guests is a remarkable transition in the property's significance as the civil rights era was ushered in. And they have some really fascinating, important guests that come stay there. So Doug Wilder, who is a former Virginia governor, but also former mayor of Virginia and, and was the first black governor. Um, he also was the godfather to one of the Sheffield's daughters and bought her a pony named Tonko. Robert Cooley, who he was a 
black lawyer who led the campaign to have his family recognized as descendants of Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings. And he was born in Richmond, raised in Petersburg, attended Howard Law School, had a military career, established uh, Petersburg's first integrated law firm, was the first black judge for Petersburg District Court, and the first black federal magistrate for the Eastern District of Virginia. And you could really go on and on. He has so many more accolades, but um, he was a frequent guest of Brooke Berry as well. And then U.S. Representative Charles Rangel of New York, former congressman, he and his family would spend many Thanksgivings with the Sheffields. So there they are kind of packing up outside Brooke Berry one year. So let's see, other takeaways. I think, um, Mike, I was going to have you kind of talk about the rarity of Brookberry and how there might not be that many other houses similar of its vintage left to explore. Yeah, that's very true. Uh, to find find standing quarters uh, within uh, that kind of proximity to the house or anywhere on property these days is is becoming uh, very rare. Um, those archaeologically um, are, are uh, they're an archaeological gold mine, I should say. Um, to be able to have those that close to the house and be able to test archaeologically those uh, and compare the results with archaeology around the house can inform us uh, uh, to a great extent about the differences, uh, the life ways of the, the plantation owners versus uh, the enslaved population. Um, yeah, we could we could uh, go on for a long time about how how wonderful that resource would be for our research. Um, it's a really fantastic property and, and really should be tested um, and a very rare thing, especially within the limits of the city of Richmond. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, um, thank you so much. Um, if we had been filming this live, we would go to Q&As, but we're pre-recording it. So I am just going to close with for more than eight decades, Historic Richmond has worked to preserve, protect, and promote Richmond's historically, architecturally, and culturally significant structures. And we're grateful to people like you who attend live or later our programs and support our work and care about historic places. You can visit our website, historicrichmond.com to learn more about our upcoming events and advocacy. And you can learn more about how to research your own property. Um, this is kind of a shot of our homepage and you can go to the resources and then down to how to research a historic property. Um, and of course, as a nonprofit, we welcome your support for our preservation programs and work. We're so grateful for your interest in this program and for joining us tonight as we peel back the layers of the onion to search for Brookberry's history and stories of so many people whose stories are intertwined with this place, some known and some yet to be discovered. Brookberry may ultimately be sold at auction later this year, and if so, we would dearly love to see Brookberry in the hands of another family who appreciates its historic significance the way we do. So thank you so much and have a good evening and i'm going to try to end this webinar now take care thank you